Thank you so much. Alrighty, so I'm gonna begin. Um, so like uh, our two introductory people uh, <laughs> said, the title of our um, presentation is Erasure is Violence, Queering Sex, Sex Education in New Brunswick through cell phone production. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about our project titled Sequin, which stands for the Sex Education Queer Youth Need. Uh, and before we get, go any further, I just want to do a bit of a land acknowledgement. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather virtually um, is the territory of the Willistoquake people. Um, and that means the people of the beautiful river. Uh, and we're bound by the peace and friendship treaties, uh, which is especially important when we look at the ongoing movements of resistance right now. Uh, so we acknowledge that colonialism and genocide are both ongoing processes and that um, it is important that we recognize and can make those connections in all of the work that we do. Uh, and we stand in solidarity with movements of resistance from Eunice Stoughton to Mi'kma'ki, um, as well as the more localized movements of resistance, including um, the grandmothers that are occupying Officer Square today, um, as well as the movement for uh, a land claim um, in New Brunswick by the Willistoke, the Willistoke people. And we borrow our title, Erasure is Violence, uh, from Rebecca Mulholland, uh, whose 2000, uh, 2020 dissertation is called Historical Erasure is Violence, the Lives and Experiences of Black Transgender Women and Gender Nonconforming Women of Color in the 19th and 20th century. And we're also inspired in this work by uh, the work of Miranda, or sorry, Amanda Myron, pardon me, Biluita Hazawin from UNB, who writes in her uh, master's thesis, historical and contemporary processes of colonization have frequently subjected indigenous women, and we would like to include two-spirit, non-binary, and trans-indigenous folks to several forms of violence and injustice due to the intersections of race, class, and gender. So we'd like to center all of those voices and ideas in the work that we are doing here today. So uh, a little bit about me. I've already been introduced, but I come to this work as a professor at UNB. And I met Megan through Imprint Youth Association. Um, and so Imprint Youth Association is a group based in Fredericton, and they support trans and queer young people um, in the city. And so that's sort of how I came to the project. I'm cisgender and I'm white and I'm um, partnered with a dude but bisexual. And so that's who I am. Uh, so my name is Megan and I've also already been introduced, but um, I'm coming to this project as a student, as um, was already mentioned. Uh, and I came through uh, to this project, the Sequin Project, through as a volunteer with Imprint Youth Association. Um, yeah, I'm also white, I'm queer, uh, and this is a project that's very near and dear to my heart. Sorry, this is me as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about like the who, what, when, where of Sequin. Um, so like I said, Sequin is the sex education queer youth need. The, key, the U is silent. <laughs> Um, and if you just see the image on the screen, that comes directly from the website. Uh, and it reads uh, that Sequin is an ever evolving website aiming to fill the gaps in mainstream public sex sexual education. Um, so this website aims to be a sex positive, queer centered focus for queer and trans youth and their educators in New Brunswick. Um, and there's a bit of a land acknowledgement there as well. So Sequin is a collaboration between AIDS New Brunswick Imprint Youth Association and the Fredericton Feminist Film Collective. Um, so like Casey said, the Imprint Youth Association is a queer organization that aims to create space um, for queer youth in Fredericton. Uh, AIDS, AIDS New Brunswick is a um, AIDS organization. Uh, it's based in harm reduction. Um, and they do, they run a needle exchange uh, in Fredericton, Bathurst, uh, and one other place that is escaping my mind right now. Um, and the Fredericton Feminist Film Collective consists of Casey Burkholder, uh, Sabine LaBelle, and um, sometimes myself, uh, and we create cell films. Um, 
about various feminist topics. Um, so Sequin came to be through a micro, a micro grant through the Enchante Network, um, which is a really great queer organization. Um, and we began in early February uh, and we aim to address um, sex education mainly in New Brunswick. Uh, yeah, I think that's everything. <laughs> Uh, so as KN knows, because they took my course on sex ed in, uh, at the University of New Brunswick, there's not a lot of queer focused material at all. There's almost no inclusion of gender identity or sexuality beyond heteronormative uh, sex for reproduction, abstinence focused sex ed in the context of New Brunswick. And we see this as a real problem um, in terms of education, but we also see it as a problem in terms of the erasure of young people from seeing themselves and their sexuality and gender in the world. And so school is one of the places that young people see themselves. And so we decided to take a look at, you know, what's in the curriculum. We found almost nothing. And then we started to look out to our community and ask folks, okay, in your opinion, in your experience, what's missing? And so one of the things that we did was we asked what was missing from school-based sex ed. So like Casey mentioned, having participatory research is really important to this project. Um, our entire project is based upon um, information that we gathered from queer and trans youth in New Brunswick. Um, so our original uh, conception of this project was a little different from, from what was actually created. Uh, we originally came together in February before the pandemic hit North America, um, and we had conceptualized something, um, some sort of conference, um, but we had to shift our plans like everybody did. Uh, and we ended up creating an online website uh, with hopes to expand um, later on. Uh, and so creating participatory research online created some challenges, but the way that we did that is through social media. Um, and like most groups, queer folks had to turn to online community um, to, to find community. Um, and this is especially important for queer and trans youth as some of them are, are living in unsafe um, and unsupportive homes. Um, so online queer participa participatory work is um, especially important during COVID-19. Um, yeah, so the, the images that you see on the screen come from our Facebook outreach that we did uh, when we were um, conceptualizing our project. So um, the questions on the screen are what informed the work that we went on to do. And it's important to also recognize that even our name, Sequin, Sex Education Queer Youth Need, comes from the community. Originally, we weren't sure what to call the project. And so again, we went out to Facebook to the community and said, what can we call this? Please help us. And that's where we came up with Sequin. And uh, that name comes from Al Cusack, who's a local artist and activist. So um, we had these questions that informed our work. And we also took a look at social media as a resource, as Mankin said, like it was really important for us to be asset informed, to meet the community where they could meet safely. Obviously in COVID-19, we can't come together physically in the same kind of a way, but we also wanted to support young people and pay them for their time. So to give people gift cards, for example, and to value what it was they were saying. And the other thing is that a lot of time curricula is created in a way that it's uh, directed at young people but it doesn't necessarily respond to their own ways of seeing in the world or their own experiences. And we wanted Sequin to be curriculum created by youth for youth and their teachers. So the idea was to go to young people, to find out what mattered to them, what their experiences were, their understanding, and then to both share what we understood them saying and then create resources that spoke specifically to the concerns that they were raising in these kind of open public forums. Did you want to add anything else here? Okay. Um, so like any project, there's um, opportunities and challenges that come with all work. Um, so specifically in our project, we uh, did something kind of different where we were creating a project um, that was both academic and kind of 
practical on the ground um, work. Um, so yeah, we collaborated with uh, between academia and uh, community organizations. Um, so we think that it's really important to build those bridges because you don't want um, knowledge to just stay trapped within the institution and you don't want the practical knowledge that comes from the ground to stay away from academia. Uh, so it's important to, to build those bridges, but there's also challenges that come um, from working with different types of organizations. Um, so specifically, uh, there were unequal expectations of time and labor um, between volunteers um, and paid workers um, for time and labor, uh, which is an issue when we're talking about violence because this project is, is both queer and feminist. And when there's unequal um, shares of time and labor, um, that violence is reproduced even within, within the project. Um, so we think that it's important to address the disparities between those who are em employed and paid um, to do this type of um, community building and those who come to the table as volunteers. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about cell phone methodology um, to explain and set up what's coming next in the project. So as Megan identified, we sent out questions to folks in the community online and asked them things like, what was missing from your sex ed experience? Or wh what media taught you about sex and relationships? And when participants or when folks in the community responded to those questions, we took their responses, anonymized them, and then turned them into short cell films. And a cell film is very simply a cell phone plus a prompt or intention and the practice of making a film. So it's a cell phone video that addresses a particular prompt or uh, intention. That's a cell phone. Cell phone methodology comes from South Africa. It comes from the work of Kay and Tomaselli and Jonathan Dockney. And uh, together, this kind of method has been also used in South Africa in the context of exploring the lives of girls and young women and gender-based violence, especially in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. But this work has also traveled and it's existing all over, including in Oaxaca, in Mexico, in Hong Kong, in New Brunswick, uh, in Toronto, working with people who are sex workers. Like it's, it's a method that uh, adapts people's everyday media-making practice and turns it toward an issue of concern. And so in our project together, we created short cell films, again, that captured what people were going to be uh, or what people had told us. But we did a couple of things intentionally as we created the cell films, and Megan's going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the process of um, creating a cell phone. Um, so overall, the process of creating a cell phone was very collaborative. Um, it was creative and it was a joyful process. Um, so like Casey said, we began with an idea. So those ideas came straight from the community. They came from the queer and trans youth that responded to our questions on social media. So for example, one of our questions was, um, what media do you find information about sex and, and sexual health or something along those lines? Um, so we began with a prompt uh, and then uh, we wrote a script based on on the responses that we got from from our Facebook page. Uh, from the script, um, we would decide what we wanted the video to look like. So sometimes that meant um, in this photo, actually, uh, we used a, a strawberry and um, a little like house thing <laughs> uh, and um, used the strawberry. Um, other times, that's uh, we made. Um, a collage and some genderless blobs and had them move around the screen. Um, one thing we were very intentional about um, making these videos was um, thinking about what imagery we wanted on the screen. We are very aware of the overrepresentation of whiteness in, um, in media. And so we were intentional not to have things like our white hands in, in the video um, because we want folks of all races and genders to see themselves in in the content that we are creating. Um, so um, similarly, we didn't want to assign certain gender or uh, reaffirm a binary within our videos um, because this is specifically um, for queer and trans youth. Um, so storyboarding 
Um, similarly, we, we would just decide in what order um, things would go in and then um, the filming, uh, the different tasks would be shared among the collaborators. Um, Casey did the editing. Uh, and then we would put that video out for feedback and discussion um, from our sequin group um, and then distribute and archive it both on our website and on social media. Oh, and on our YouTube video, our YouTube page as well. Yeah, so the idea is that it's collaborative and that people might be able to respond back or to speak back to the works that we create either through comments or by creating media of their own um, that responds to what we're saying. But they, the videos did get a little bit of, uh, I don't know, people noticed them. So we thought we would show you three of our short cell films and um, get you to see the kinds of ways that we took participant information and made it into a video. And so each one um, is about two and a half minutes long. So we're going to show three, and then I'd like to open it up as a discussion to the group. And we're going to ask you, what do you see and what resonated with you in these films? And you, of course, don't have to speak out loud. You can always um, respond in the chat. So just forgive me a moment while I find the videos. While Casey is just getting those videos up, um, I will suggest that people turn off their video just while these videos are playing, just to improve the quality um, of the video. Thank you. first one that we'd like to share with you and I'd like you all to notice the way that we end each of the videos so just keep that in the back of your mind the next time we are sharing um, here we are <laughs>
final film that we're going to show you is this one, which is How Can We Reflect Trans Experiences in Sex Ed? Now is the time that we're going to ask folks what resonated with you and what did you see? Oops. Megan, while I'm sharing my screen, can you see if there's any uh, responses to those questions? I don't see anything yet. Okay. So you can either uh, pose a question using your microphone or you can use the chat function, either way. Hello, can people hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, Miranda, Hi. go ahead. I found I found the the content and the language being used really accessible. It didn't feel like here's an academic study and you have to be speaking an academic terminology and have a whole bunch of um, experience and knowledge base and expertise in this area to engage with it. And I think um, that makes it more accessible. And I liked that about those videos and it felt very <clears throat> approachable um, on that regard. And I also noticed that some of the contents were coming from places of personal experiences and others were coming from individuals who weren't trans or queer and also had some um, thoughts and comments to contribute to the space as well. And uh, it was interesting to see the different perspectives. Thank you. I'm seeing a comment in the chat and I can read it out loud. It says, there should be also something in sex ed about gender dysphoria 
and how it might affect sexual relationships. Anything else that folks wanted to respond to about the videos, what they saw? What responses have we received from teachers to the cell phones? That's a great question. Um, so far, not very many. So our website, sequin.com, is targeting both teachers, but primarily youth at this point. So because a lot of the resources right now are sort of explanatory, like this is a body part, this is menstruation, this is like an act, or like this is abortion, whatever it is that we're talking about on the site, um, at this point, we don't have any material that's directed at teachers in terms of like, here's an easy lesson plan that you can take, but that's one of the future directions of the project because one of the things we've noticed is that folks aren't necessarily, teachers aren't necessarily engaging with the work at this point. But also we still have to get it out there and we have more work to do. As we say in the website, it's ever evolving. And one of the ways that is ever evolving is through the production of sort of teacher focused resources so that teachers can take these films into the classroom and have students to think about them, to uh, create their own films in response. There's a lot of different things that you can do, but sometimes it's helpful to have those ready-made resources. And so that's something that we're working on. I will just add to that, Casey. So part of what we are doing with this website is addressing gaps in the sex education system from outside of the education system because as AIDS New Brunswick knows because they do these types of presentations around HIV prevention um, and STBBI prevention there's limitations to working within the education system for example some teachers may not be open to sharing information about queer and trans experiences and so that's why it's so important to have this resource outside living like on online for everybody to access. So while we would be really excited if a teacher brought this website into their classroom, it was not necessarily created to be within the system. It's meant to be outside of it. But that being said, we do have a section on the website that is for educators and we have information that's more theoretical than explanatory in the education section. But like Casey said, we're working on writing um, more accessible lesson plans for educators so that they can incorporate that knowledge into the day-to-day -day classroom. And I think something to speak back to sort of what Miranda was talking about, it's important in the language that we use in the way that we write the material in the Sequin website for youth, it's like the cell phones. Like we're, the cell phones sound accessible because they are anonymized versions of voices of youth. Like they're really, that's how people talk. That's what they were saying. And so we wanted to take that same kind of practice and turn it towards uh, the website as well. And Kayan noticed, noted something uh, in the chat and I'm gonna read it out loud. Uh, the focus on the necessity of practical self-directed knowledge. The majority of the videos really highlighted questions we've all considered on a much deeper understanding of personalized experience. That's a great point. And I think it also speaks to what Megan was saying, which is like, sometimes sexuality, especially when you're a young person, is embarrassing and you want to be able to find something that can explain things to you that you don't have to ask people out loud. You can like do this piece on your own and ask for clarification. There's spaces for asking for clarification. Um, yeah, Megan, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Well, there is another comment there. Um, it says, did you find that participants were also discussing or seeking tools and resources about having conversations with their parents in regards to their experiences? Particularly, I'm interested in those related to the last video you shared. Thanks. That's the one about trans experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were pretty deliberate in not framing the website f being for parents necessarily. Um, I think there are some sex ed resources out there. I don't know if they're necessarily aimed at queer and trans, um, parents of queer and trans youth, but um, we wanted something for queer and trans youth because you said sex and sexuality can be kind of a shameful thing when you're young. Um, and especially for queer and trans youth who may not be out to their families or may not have accepting or supportive families, having an online space that they don't need to, um, like that can be kind of secretive um, where they can access open 
um, and sex positive information is really important, but I'll let you speak to that as well, Casey. Yeah, I think it's important. I get this question sometimes from people who say, I have a friend who's a parent and their child is trans and they are worried and I always point them in direction of the existing organizations that we have in these spaces, places like Imprint, but also the Fredericton Gender Minorities. Like there's a lot of different spaces that offer resources from a community perspective. But I think Megan's right, this piece is really for, by and for youth, because I think that's what we noticed was a, a huge gap, but you're right. Like there's so much more work to be done and we're on the case. Absolutely. We'll keep working. Um, okay. So do you want to finish this off, Megan? Yeah, so this is, we're nearing the end here, um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about our next steps um, for this project, and we've mentioned a few throughout the presentation. Um, so yeah, sex, uh, sex education queer youth needs sequin is an uh, ever-evolving project, uh, and that includes the content on the website. Um, we're still going back, editing, adding, um, putting new resources into that website. Um, so one of our future plans includes um, like a community editing of the website because we want to center the experiences of queer and trans youth. We want them to be interacting with this resource. So um, in the future, we hope to be holding some webinars and workshops that are interacting both with the material and also just with the resource itself. Um, we wanted to draw your attention to this art contest that we held. Uh, so this was during our launch of the website, uh, which was near the end of July, I believe. Um, yeah, so we put a call out for um, artists to respond to a prompt about um, what it means to have sex education for um, queer and trans youth. Uh, and we had some really, really um, beautiful submissions and you can find them all actually on our website on the sequin website um and we had um like prizes for all of the winners um and like we mentioned we also are in the works of developing lesson plans for educators to accessibly um, incorporate the information on the website into classrooms um, we hope to expand this project uh beyond uh just new brunswick we're thinking um, perhaps of expanding to Atlantic Canada to connect with other um, sex education groups and queer and trans organizations um, and applying to grants to um, further this project. Um, and like I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, when we had originally conceptualized this project, we thought about doing um, a conference style. So perhaps um, if there is a post-COVID, um, world we could have a um, uh, in-person conference of some sort. Um, so we welcome you to check us out. Uh, this is our website sequin.com. You can also follow the Fredericton Feminist Film Collective where we show a variety of works uh, by and for queer trans and non-binary uh, folks, young people. And Thank you so much for your time. We hope that this has given you an opportunity to conceptualize the erasure of queer and trans folk from um, sex ed in general as an instance of violence and the ways in which we can do community-based research and community-based action in order to confront that violence. So thank you so much. <laughs>